work. That is a more general definition. Uh, to do something, okay, to study, for example, for me to talk, okay, that is that requires energy, okay. Um, now, but here this chapter is dealing with not only defining energy, it's also defining how we measure energy. There are units, you know, as in chemistry or in any science, there are certain units to measure energies, right? So one of the common units that we're using is our data, what was the common unit that we measure energy. And you left, uh, because you have some issues. Calorie, very good. Calorie, one of the units. And the other unit was joules. joules. And that there is also certain values of calories and joules. Calories, sometimes uh, you have uh, food nutritional values, OK? Food nutritional values are measured in a different calories. Okay, uh, if you remember, we put a little bit different C, right? Which is a big C. Okay, a big C refers to a calorie, right? And in fact, we also calculated about how much calorie we get from protein, how much calorie we get from fats, and how much calorie we get from carbohydrates, right? And then, for example, if you have uh, 23 grams of fat or 26 grams of protein and how much calories it produces. And we know that one gram of uh, protein generates about uh, four calories, right? And then we can multiply that and we know how much energy that we gain. Uh, we also discussed about, um, uh, this is a little bit different. Bigger? I don't even know where the space is. Oh, no, over there. Um, all the way to the left. All the way to the left. Oh, here? Okay, okay. Yeah, here you can see that a calorie is the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of one gram by one degree centigrade. Uh, there is also some things that you'll be familiar with maybe in the lab, a specific heat capacity. That's a little bit different than calorie specific heat capacity, which is C. It's a, again C, <laughs> small C, okay? Uh, specific heat capacity means, you know, how much energy can a substance absorb, okay? How much energy can a substance absorb is measured in specific heat capacity. Uh, because different substances have different specific heat capacity, like uh, uh, if you go to, um, um, in Ocean City, for example, in summertime, you feel warm or your feet will be burned when you touch the sun. But the water is still cold. Okay? Um, there is more there is explanation for that. That is because of the specific capacity of the substance. Because both of them get heat energy anyway from the sun, from the solar system. But sun is hot, water is still cold. Uh, the reason one of the reasons that can be explained there is that because of how much energy, how much heat energy a water can absorb to raise the temperature, and how much heat energy a sun can absorb to raise the temperature. That's two different things. Okay? So the sun gets very, very burning, but the water is still cold anyway, because it requires a lot of energy to raise it. Okay, thank you. It requires a lot, a lot of energy to raise the temperature of water. That is, that is the principle is actually specific heat capacity. We're going to have to remember those formulas. Which formulas? Uh, well, that will be given to you, but we did calculations, I remember. Uh, you guys left a little bit uh, earlier that day, but we did calculations. So, is that, uh, for example, I'm not going to ask you, um, what is a calorie per protein, the calorie per gram of carbohydrates, a calorie per gram of fat. Yeah, this will be given to you, but you need to do the calculation part. Okay. Um, this, I think this was then. Mm -hmm. We have uh, We have to deliver? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, that means uh, we are, uh, we are, Oh, well, then it's also important to talk about um, intermolecular forces, because uh, you might have uh, 
equations regarding these intermolecular forces. We know two types of bonds, the common two types of bonds that we know, okay, of each of us, ionic bond and covalent. This is the known bond that when there is interaction between molecules, we have two bonds. Where do we experience ionic bond? Cassie, where do you experience ionic bond? Non-metals and metals. If you have non-metals and metals, you experience ionic bond. Where do you experience covalent bonds? Non-metals and non-metals. Now, but there are something called intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces. This is the attraction between inside the molecules. Okay? Like in other words, the attraction between hydrochloric acid and another hydrochloric acid. The attraction between water, one water molecule. How do the water molecules are interconnected to each other? Okay, well, that is one bond. <laughs> that is one bond. But the, this is called intermolecular forces, anyways. We call them intermolecular forces. Hydrogen bond, yes. Water is connected by hydrogen bond. Uh, hydrogen bond is a good example for, for a water molecule. Uh, we have a London dispersion force. London dispersion force. We have a dipole dipole interaction. I don't know if there is here, but there is iron dipole interaction that well maybe maybe in here, maybe not. We will see on the next slide. These forces are existed in ionic compounds and in molecular compounds. Okay? They are they are they are connected to the molecules. They are intramolecular forces. Okay? Uh, a London dispersion force. What is a London dispersion force? How a London dispersion force is generated? How did it come? Where does that come from? London dispersion force. London is, by the way, uh, last time I told you, it's the name of the person, the name of the scientist who actually developed this theory. And based on that, it's called a London dispersion force. Anybody remember that? What's a London dispersion force? Yes. Uh, yes, it is a, a London dispersion force actually comes with the unequal distributions of electrons. Unequal distributions of electrons. Now, in an atom, we are assuming that electrons are distributed in a symmetrical way, in equal way, right? Like, t say for example, take helium atom. One helium atom is connected with another helium atom. What is the force inside them? Where does that force come from? Because always when we are thinking about interaction forces, we always think about a positive and a negative force, right? You have a partial positive charge, you have a negative charge. So different charge always makes interaction. But there's a situation that you have, you don't have protons, you don't have a positively charged particles, right? You have electrons, you have electrons. But there's interaction. That is how uh, a London dispersion force is generated. What it happens here, I don't know if you have a picture here. Yeah, what would happen here, this, this, show, this shows you uh, uh, an example how London dispersion force between uh, two CH4 molecules existed. Uh, CH4 molecule is a covalent bond, and uh, sometimes the electron distribution, the electron distribution on one side will be larger, the electron distribution on the other side will be smaller, okay? Be between this is CH4 molecule and another CH4 molecule, you have less electron density here, okay? See, um, this, this is not like something that we say, but electrons are in movement. If you think about electrons are in movement. 24-7 electrons are in movement. They are, they are not stationary, they are not in one position. And it is obvious that at one point, all the electrons will be on one side, and on the other side, there will be a lack of electrons. That's bingo, that's good, that's like a snapshot. That's like where dispersion force can be created. Because on one side you have huge density of electrons, that means it is negatively charged. On one side that you have less electron density, that is, that creates what? A positively charged. So, now you see, between even between two electrons, between the electron, between two electrons the density, I would better say, you can create opposite charges. That's how the dispersion force is created. Less electron density in one region creates a partial positive charge, like right here. More electron density in one region creates a partial negative charge. 
and that creates what? That creates attraction. Now, this Persian force is weaker because it is not really stronger as hydrogen bonding or iron dipole bonding. It's a weaker bond, but there is attraction there. Okay, there is attraction there. It's very, it is one of the weakest link. It's one of the weakest bonds of all the intermolecular forces. Whereas hydrogen bonding is stronger. Remember, hydrogen bonding is stronger. Um, how do we know hydrogen bonding is stronger? You take the boiling point of water. You see, the boiling point of water is 100 degrees centigrade. Okay? Uh, the boiling point of ammonia is also greater. Now, hydrogen bonding is what? Hydrogen bonding means it's a bond between hydrogen and some high electronegative ions. That means it's a bonding between hydrogen and oxygen. It's a bonding between hydrogen and nitrogen. And it's a bonding between hydrogen and oh, chlorine. Uh, it was hydrogen and oxygen, hydrogen and nitrogen. No, it's not chlorine. It's not chlorine. No, not chlorine. The Hydrogen and fluorine, yes. Yes, hydrogen and fluorine. You're right. Hydrogen and fluorine. It makes sense. Because fluorine has a higher electronegativity element. Yeah. Fluorine has fluorine has a highest electronegativity element. It's four point zero by the way. So it is a bond between hydrogen and fluorine, hydrogen and oxygen, and hydrogen and nitrogen. And it's a stronger bond. Unfortunately, uh, hydrogen bond is only between the bond of these three elements, between hydrogen and nitrogen, between hydrogen and oxygen, and hydrogen and fluorine. And also there is, there should be, the other requirement for hydrogen bonding is that there should be also what? A lone pair of electrons available. Lone pair of electrons, okay? So, uh, a lone pair of electrons, which is unpaired, unpaired electrons, and also they, uh, they are ready to react with other ions because they are non pair they need, they need a partner, they need a connection with the other, the other ions. So uh, that's the requirement. That's the hydrogen bond is a stronger bond, yes. I know you said um, electrons are not stationary. Mm -hmm. So in this No, if you look at it here, this is a partially positive charge here. These are, these are not electrons here. A partially positive charge versus a partially negative charge here. A partially negative charge means there is more electron density. Okay, the charge of electron is negative. A partially positive charge refers to you that there is a less number of electrons. That is the weakest number of electrons. Okay, so it's not a plus, a plus, a plus sign is an indication that there is less electron density in one region. A minus, a minus sign indicates there is more electron density. So that actually creates inducing, that creates a force. And that force, it's not the same thing as electronic activity. This is the same atom, the same electrons. Okay, now, you know, now, we say helium has two electrons, but the reality helium doesn't have two electrons. Honestly speaking, helium has a billion number of electrons, okay? For a systematic reason, we just count the outermost shell electron, but, you know, there are like a billion number of atoms of electrons. So, on one side, a huge density of electrons will be on one side, and less density of electrons will be on the other side. Uh, to understand this, So, you know, uh, this, this kind of theory is better explained in quantum mechanical model of an atom. We all learn the bottom model of an atom. Atoms have two shells in the first electrons, eight shells in the second, eight electrons, uh, two 18 electrons, and our mind is concentrated only in this fixed number of electrons. Honestly speaking, that is wrong. That is false. Because electrons are not counted. Okay? You have densities. Have that is a good way of explaining, for explaining, for understanding, just to create interaction. But the truth of the matter is lie beyond that. Beyond that. Um, 
Okay, we have hydrogen bonding here. You know, hydrogen bonding is like water is. Uh, remember this? Let me ask you on the test. Hydrogen bonds are the strongest of the three types of intermolecular forces. So you can say this is like uh, okay, here. Here is okay. The, okay, here is a dipole-dipole interaction. Uh, a dipole-dipole interaction exists. Uh, they are practiced between the permanent dipoles of two polar molecules, okay? Um, wh what's dipole-dipole interaction? Let's say that you have a, a formaldehyde here, okay? You have CHO here. Uh, one CHO is here. Uh, we have oxygen is here. And then we have carbon is here. Carbon has, it is an attraction between two the same molecules. Okay, dipole dipole interaction is going to be an attraction between two molecules. Now, how this happens? There are two things I want you to be focused on dipole dipole interaction. One, orientation. Orientation. So, orientation is the molecules have to be oriented. Uh, the oxygen end has to be connected with the carbon end here because oxygen has a partially negative charge. A carbon has, compared to oxygen, a carbon has uh, a positively charged. Particle. So there is interaction between these two. What is the intensity? What is the strength of interaction? That's another <coughs> question. But there is intermolecular interaction anyway. Okay? So that's a dipole dipole interaction. How do you know if it's a negative or Um there's a lot of things that you should know. You should know. One of the things is that uh, think about the predict table, generally speaking. Electronegativity increases from left to right. Generally, right? So, if I have carbon and oxygen in this case, okay, I can guess, I can guess which one has a higher electronegativity, which one has a higher electro, uh, which one has a higher electropositivity. Okay, now if if it comes if it comes carbon and oxygen, without even remembering or noticing the number, I can tell you oxygen has a higher electronegativity than carbon mm -hmm. because oxygen is on the right. Of carbon in the pairing table. Now, you may have a situation between um, nitrogen dioxide and nitrogen dioxide. The, more, the interaction between nitrogen dioxide and nitrogen dioxide. Now, we know we know for sure nitrogen is a nonmetal. Oxygen is also a nonmetal, right? Compared to nitrogen and oxygen, one has to be more electronegative. The other has to be less electronegative. So I would conclude, or I'll give you a summary that uh, nitrogen has a positive charge than oxygen. Am I right or wrong? Okay, so, okay, okay. Uh, nitrogen has, which one? Is it nitrogen or oxygen has a higher electronegative? Oxygen. Oxygen. Why? Because oxygen is located what? Oxygen is located on the right. So a partial negative charge is on oxygen, and a partial positive charge is on what? On, on nitrogen. So the part of the right, it has negative charge, and to the left, it has positive charge. Positive charge, yes. yes. Now, in this case, for example, in formaldehyde, it is an organic compound, unsaturated organic compound. We so have oxygen and carbon. So even non-metals can be positive? Yes, uh, relatively. Okay. Relati now, you know, don't take this in, in words. Uh, positive means that there is less electron density there. Okay, there is, less, there is more electrical attraction, there is more uh, electrical attraction on oxygen side. There is more electron on oxygen side, so there is high electron, high electron density on oxygen side less electron density on nitrogen. So there is a dipole-dipole interaction between nitrogen dioxide, right? A dipole-dipole interaction. So that is exactly what it means. It's one of three, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Oh, uh, 